I'm here on a dark and stormy day in, uh, in, in St. Louis, of course. I might close this window a little bit because the zoom can act a little bit weird. So let me close the drapes. Hopefully that'll help the zoom. It will be pretty dark in here. We had a storm come through a few minutes ago, but I hope you're doing well wherever you are. Let me get that to refocus here. Come on camera, you can do this. Focus on me, okay. Oh, nope, still not there. Hopefully it'll figure it out. Um, yeah, we'll wait a second to see if it figures out. You can deal with Fuzzy Jamie for a minute. Tony, Dominic, Chad says there's a, a storm in Michigan as well. George is here. Why isn't this focusing now? I'm sure this is riveting for podcast listeners. Here it is. I think it is starting to focus. Hopefully that worked. Um, yeah, I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here for the next hour to chat with you, answer your questions, discuss random topics. I just got a fun email from a TV show, an, a TV show that doesn't exist yet. And we get these emails every now and then saying like, can we, is it okay if we put one of your, um, one of your games on like the shelves in the background of a scene and that type of thing, which I always find very odd to ask for permission. Like, of course we want our games in the background of a, of a TV show. I guess maybe there are very selective TV shows that maybe are very offensive. I can't think of many that I wouldn't walk in, want in the background, but very rare. Um, they've asked to put tapestry plans and ploys. I can't say that, I, well, I probably shouldn't say the TV show. And between two castles of Mad King Ludwig. Um, Interesting choices just to put right there. Like I'm, I'm sure I'm definitely happy with that, but they didn't ask for taps or they asked for the, one of the expansions and between two castles might be a little hard because we don't have many copies left of that. So, uh, like, of course I'll say yes, but I might offer some alternatives if, uh, if they, if they want to think about that. Yeah. Sounds like a, a fun episode. Anyway. Um, yeah, so it's fun to, to think about that. Shaked says, uh, happy Passover. Happy Passover to you too. Yeah, we're in uh, Easter week for uh, people who are Christian or Catholic. Um, I believe Ramadan might have just finished, or maybe it's still still finishing up here. Whatever religion, if you celebrate a religion, if you follow religion, I hope you are, uh, I hope you, your religion is going well. Um, Ray says, uh, Between Two Cities was a hit last week when I introduced it to my game group. Going to play side this week, and I'm hyped. Thanks for sharing our game with your group, Ray. What, did you share the old version of Between Two Cities or the new Essential Edition? And uh, hope you get to play Scythe this week. I have a video about Scythe's sequel, Expeditions, coming out tomorrow. The game isn't coming out. The video for Expeditions is coming out tomorrow. And this video, I filmed it last week. What, what is it about? This is, okay, so it, this video is about the end of the game. So what end of the game conditions, what the end of the, like the condition, the end of the game con condition in Expeditions, and what end game scoring looks like. This was a, a suggestion from someone who was watching one of my Expeditions videos. I have more on the way, uh, but that one will come out tomorrow. Uh, Nathan says he saw an interview with Andrew Bosley, and it was cool to hear more about Tapestry from the artist standpoint. Uh, I'll have to check that out. I, I feel like I saw a video about that somewhere. I didn't actually watch the video, but um, I love hearing artists talk about their process, and Andrew is wonderful to work with. And Suzanne, my coworker Susanna is here to say hi. Suzanne, I hope you're doing well. Your, uh, your avatar has this exact shirt on, so I feel like we're wearing the same thing today, even though you're probably wearing something different. And Chad says uh, about the show, I wonder if they're curating their background scenes for those particular colors. Oh, they might be. That's an interesting point. Um, certain colors in the background. Yeah, that could definitely be it. Before I forget, I had something fun happen last week that's tied to my chocolate of the day. So I, there was a, a big group of publishers and content creators who came through St. Louis on their way to the Gamers Ranch, which is kind of like a big, well, it is a big vacation property with a ton of games, like a ton of modern games run by someone who um, kind of retired from his job. I think he still partially works for his job, but he re partially retired from his job and created this mecca for, for gamers to come to. Around 20 plus gamers can go to this place. There's also a disc golf course on the property. You may remember if you follow me or some other games that I went to this place last summer with some friends. But a bunch of people came through town and I got to have dinner with many of them before they went on to the Gamers Ranch. And I also played disc golf with David from Man vs. Meeple. And the dinner was with a few different publishers like Queen Games, um, Vital Lacerda was there, and a Connor uh, Magui. Uh, Magui? What is Connor's last name? Connor usually just call him Connor from Inside Up Games. Connor McGooey, I got it right. Probably pronounced differently. Um, but I got to have dinner with them 
locally here. It was wonderful to sit down and just talk about games and game design and games that we're excited about there. And Connor was very gracious to also attend my game night that night and to teach Earth. So I got to play Earth, one of the games, the tableau building games that I'm really, really excited about. And Connor was incredibly great. Connor was so kind. He brought chocolate from Canada. So he brought this chocolate from Canada. You can't, probably can't read it there, but it is maple crisp milk chocolate bark from a place called chocolatecow.net. And I have only one piece left because Megan and I really like this chocolate. The crisp is really nice. The maple was a nice flavor, but it wasn't too strong. So thank you so much for Con to Connor for coming through here, so, uh, coming through St. Louis, teaching Earth, giving us the chocolate, joining us for dinner. That was really special. My coworkers, uh, Susanna, Dave, and Joe joined us as well at dinner, which was fun. To, always fun to see all of them. Uh, Kevin says he received a shipping notification for the new Rolling Realms promos. He's looking forward to them. And Kevin, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have a quick shipping update um, from Joe. Joe shared with me that pretty much every copy of uh, the new t-shirts, the April Fool's t-shirts and the April Fool's, or uh, not April Fool's, but we put them out on April Fool's, the, uh, the new promos for Rolling Realms have shipped. He said there are a few odd copies here and there that haven't shipped yet. Maybe they're tied to orders with things that aren't in stock yet. But if you order those things, by now you should have received an order, uh, a shipping notification. So um, not to worry necessarily yet if you haven't, but especially if your order had other things in it that maybe aren't in stock right now. Um, although we don't sell things that aren't in stock. So uh, yeah, that, would, that wouldn't be it. So maybe there's just a few odd orders missing so far. So uh, if you haven't received your shipping order, a notification by the end of the week that might be a small concern but for now you're totally fine and your order has probably already shipped um gerald says would you do a two-player playthrough video of expeditions for a few rounds pretending the other player is biddy you know i have a new camera set up that might allow me to do that i i might be able to try to do that gerald so far i have a kind of a, a one player taking a few turns i don't have a two player um, but I can try a two-handed play. I can I can try to do that for sure. Yeah. Tony says, any thoughts on the passing of Klaus Tuber? Did you ever meet? Tony, I have something here that I wanted to share today. Um, last night, we played Catan Cities and Nights in honor of Klaus Tuber's passing. And hopefully I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Um, so as Tony mentioned, uh, Klaus passed away at the age of 70 on April 1st, a few days ago. And uh, I've been a gamer my whole life, but as an adult, kind of after college, I was pretty much only playing card games. I was playing hearts, I was playing poker just for fun with friends, but I wasn't playing modern hobby games until a group of friends had an opening in their game night of Catan, Settlers of Catan, and invited me over. And it opened my eyes to the world of gaming. I, I saw what modern gaming could be. I saw that people like me were playing modern gaming, which I... I say it that, that way intentionally because I think that is why we are, are trying to welcome new people into the hobby all the time. That's why we try to be inclusive and accessible in everything that we create and everything we, that we do because I, it was really important for me to see. And I don't mean, uh, in my case, I don't mean that, that there were other white men playing gaming. I mean that there were other like young professionals playing games and not just like teenagers because that's why I associated with gaming. Um, when I saw there are other people like me playing games, and I fell in love with Catan at the time. And that's all we played for a long time, like a couple of years. That's all we just played Catan. And I'm saying this because without Catan, I probably wouldn't have Stonemaier games at all. Stonemaier games probably wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be, uh, I, game design wouldn't be part of what I do for a living. Running a company wouldn't be do, but wouldn't be part of what I do for a living. Um, but Catan really, really opened my eyes. Um, and that invitation from that group of friends opened my eyes. So I just wanted to thank Klaus. I, 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 and it was a good reminder to me that I should have th thanked Klaus while he was alive. I've never talked to Klaus. Um, I've never messaged him, but I could have. He probably has a way that you can message him on, on Board Game Geek. Um, and I really should have. I should have told him how big of an impact that had on me and how much that meant to me. Um, so I, I, oh, today I wanted to honor Klaus's legacy. Tony, thank you for bringing him up. Um, but it, it really has had, he has had a huge impact on my life through Catan. And so last night we did play Cities and Nights, which is my favorite way to play Catan. I haven't played all the ways to play Catan. I'm sure there are different ways, maybe even better ways. But I love the progression system in Cities and Nights. I think it adds a lot to the game. And we had a blast playing it last night. And uh, yeah, I, I won't go on and on, but he is he is incredible to me. He, he has meant so much to my life. And I wish I had told him that while he was alive. Um, so yeah. Uh, Nathan said that he was uh, on the table at Dice Tower. 
Nathan has a reference here that I'm missing. Okay, Nathan's referencing the interview with Andrew Bosley. Thank you, uh, Nathan, for sharing that link. Sam is joining us this morning. I had a nice chat with Sam recently. He said, oh, oh okay, Sam has a, a link to it as well. Thank you, Sam, for sharing that. I don't check the Discord as often as I should. Uh, I get a lot of alerts on Discord, and I often mute them, but I mean to check in from time to time to see what's going on. Tim says he's been following the Let's Go to Japan Kickstarter from AEG. What actually takes a year to go from campaign? Oh, he's asking, what actually takes a year to go from campaign to fulfillment? I would say, so if they went to print, so say the Kickstarter ended today. This is a Kickstarter that I backed because um, I love Japan and the game looks solid. So if, if they ended the Kickstarter today and sent the production ready files to the printer tomorrow, it would actually be about around six to seven months at most. So that's pre-production, production, freight shipping, and fulfillment. Maybe eight months at most. What you're seeing in that extra amount of time is that they probably haven't finished the game yet. Maybe there are elements of game design that they haven't finished, elements of art or graphic design they haven't finished. And that's that extra four months that they're adding on, uh, which actually isn't all that bad. Like I've seen campaigns that ask for a lot more time where they're only kind of still designing the game, still working on development of the game. So I, I think this is probably a good sign that they pretty much already finished uh, the, the, all those elements of, the, of design, development, playtesting, art and graphic design, and they just need a little bit more time, maybe a little bit of buffer room in there too. I think it's fine for Kickstarters to build in some buffer time uh, for their Kickstarter campaigns. Especially since if we're talking about a year, we have a month off for Chinese holidays. Mostly it's Chinese New Year, and there's, uh, I believe, the Golden Week in September. Yeah, so that's a month to add to it as well. Ray says that he owns the essential edition of Between Two Cities, the one that he taught his friends recently. He says it's great to have a game that allows for so many or so few players since our group is usually five to six people. That's exactly why, Ray, we try to have our games go up to at least five players, ideally six or seven when we get the chance without adding too much downtime or playing time. And Between Two Cities and Between Two Castles do that really well because of the simultaneous drafting and selection and placement. Everything is simultaneous in those games. Susanna says, Earth is so fantastic. I totally agree, Susanna. And I got a shipping notification for my copy of Earth. The label has been printed. And so it should show up by game night next week. I'm excited to play it again. I game night last week. Like I said, I played Catan Cities and Knights. Played Earth at game night last week. And um, what else did we play? Played Skull King. I play, And today I'm set to play Endless Winter. I haven't played Endless Winter yet, but I'm really excited about one of the hit games from last year. Excited to play that for the first time later today with uh, members of my team. Nathan says his new April Fool's Realms and Rise of Fenris. Awesome, we got Fenris too, should be arriving soon. Excited to get Fenris to the table since I taught my group Scythe and we finished our last campaign game recently. Nathan, that's exciting. I'm doing a video soon. I'm curious, maybe this will be my question. Actually, I have two questions of the day. There's one thing that I've been thinking about a lot today are skill tests in games. Do you have a game with a, a skill test that you really enjoy? So a skill test in a game is typically when a game says, you need to do X um, or have X or have X successes to gain this benefit. So here's this threshold that you need, this cost that you need to pay to gain this benefit. Um, it's a little bit different than paying resources to gain something because typically in skill tests, it is a measure of your abilities, not your resources. And there's often an element of chance to it. So do you have a favorite skill test in a game and why? My other question tied to what Nathan said here is, how do you feel about branching paths in games? So for example, in a campaign game, if uh, let's use a, a literal explanation of this, if you have a, a fork in the road and you get to choose option A or option B, um, do you prefer for option A and option B to lead to completely different outcomes that never intersect in the future, um, completely different paths in the road? Like one takes you down a completely different adventure than the other, or do you prefer for, um, if you choose option A, I guess on the far end of the spectrum, that option A and option B give you slightly different results, but results that aren't all that different. Like maybe all, like they, they lead to the same um, intersection along the way, but along one of them, you have to fight a monster and the other one, you have to negotiate with a merchant, that type of thing. Where along the way, there are slightly different results, but the constant, the end result is eventually the same, even though along the way, you might get something slightly different. So those are kind of the two far ends of the spectrum where big branching paths all the way on the other end of the spectrum are... Um, very minor consequences for the choice that you make along that branching path. What do you prefer? And I asked that partially, something that's been on my mind a lot lately, because I think instinctively, my guess is that a lot of people would say, if I make a decision, I want it to have completely different consequences. But oftentimes when I play games with, with branching paths, 
I find that I am the most immersed in the narrative if, um, if I know that my choices aren't too consequential, uh, which sounds a little bit odd say, saying that. Um, and I need to process that a little bit more when I go to the video. But I find that if, if, I, if they're too consequential, consequential, I end up maybe reading what the other passage could be or looking at what the other path could have resulted in and sometimes regretting my decision. Whereas if I know that they aren't too consequential um, all, or all that different, then, uh, then I'm kind of satisfied with the result. I'm like, okay, it isn't all that different than what I could have done, but I'm glad I made this choice. I'm glad I took this path. I'm glad that I negotiated with a merchant instead of fight, fighting the monster. Glad I made that decision. Curious what you think about those two topics, skill test and branching paths. Let me know in the comments here. These might form some, um, some opinions for an upcoming video of mine. Blake says that he has game five of Charterstone complete with his gaming group. He says his son Caleb and him are enjoying Spirit Island as well. And he says Canadians know their chocolate. Yeah, chocolate, what was this place called? Uh, chocolate Cow, Chocolate Cow. Really good chocolate with those little crisp in it. I forgot how much I like little crisp in chocolate. They add something, a little bit of texture there that I really enjoy. Corey says Travis Reynolds, Travis Reynolds from Queen Games was there at that event. He was, yeah, Travis was at the dinner too that I had. He's fantastic, basically the godfather of board games in West Virginia. He runs Charcon. Corey, yes, of course, you probably know uh, Travis and his friend, I think his name was Mark, was there with Travis. But Travis was a, a joy to talk to. He was really wonderful. I'm forgetting one of the other names um, of one of the other people that was there. He works closely with Vital. I really should remember his name. Oh, man. Susanna, can you remember the name that was of the person that was directly across from you at the table? Miles says, you will. Uh, you think Wrexham will pull off the win against Knott's County this weekend? Would almost certainly guarantee a promotion. Miles, my question for you is, how can we watch this game? I really want to watch the big game with Wrexham and Knott's this weekend. And Miles is right. Like This is a huge game for Wrexham. If they beat Knott's, they gain such a big gap in the standings that they almost guarantee themselves uh, first place in the standings. This is a, a fifth tier soccer team that Miles and I follow. Thanks to the show. Welcome to Wrexham. I really hope it's so, Miles. I'm very nervous. I think it's a home game, so maybe that's a slight advantage there. I'm very nervous. I, I think Wrexham has had maybe a little bit of a problem with these big games in recent history. So we'll see. I'm holding, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. And I would love to watch it or at least watch the highlights from it in some way. Julie says her Stillmire Games cat shirt is on the way as well. Uh, Julie has helped out with us with some proofreading recently, and that's one of the things we have in the works right now. We're proofreading a few different things. In fact, I think we're proofreading four different projects, two of which I can't say much about. One of them is the Tapestry Revised Civilizations. That's in proofreading right now. And another is another game that I, uh, I, I, can't, I can't speak about, but um, something we're doing differently for this game, something that I've learned from Expeditions, is we've essentially, we have completed the proofreading process for this game. It's done. Um, but... I am also having another bigger group of, they're proofreaders, but I'm saying maybe a little bit more casual. Um, they aren't proofreaders that, that have, they're, I'm not, I don't have anything that I expect from them. I'm just asking them if they want to take out a look at the rules and give me a little bit of feedback for anything that's not clear, then they are welcome to do so. And I've gotten some great feedback from them so far. So it is to basically kind of cover what, uh, uh, one of our shortcomings with expeditions that we fortunately discovered by putting the rulebook for expeditions making it available publicly and hearing from potential fans of the game along the way, including Gerald. I see Gerald in the comments here. He has some good thoughts about it. So that is something we're doing with a, uh, still privately, but a, but a, a bigger group with this new game right now. And, and so far we're getting some great feedback there. That also reminds me of something that I need to follow up with my graphic designer. Tim says, I was also surprised that Let's Go to Japan is expected to take so long to fulfill since they had a production quality version of Dice Tower West. So I really, I don't think it's that bad. So pre-production, production, freight shipping, fulfillment, that's seven months minimum, seven months. You add in one month for, uh, for uh, Chinese holidays over the next 12 months, that's one month, so that's eight months. And you add in, really give it two buffer months. I think two buffer months is perfectly fair. So that's 10 months. So it means that maybe they have a little bit of extra time just to make sure they get the game right before going to production because they probably are getting some feedback from backers and reviewers and things like that. I think a year is pretty reasonably reasonable and they set themselves up there to fulfill earlier than expected. So I, I would think it you, you'll probably end up getting your game in about 10 months or we will. I, I backed it too. We'll get our games in around 10 months, but uh, they set the expect expectations at, at 12. Mike says he got his Rolling Realms promos yesterday. The new promos for Rolling Realms, I'll show them off here, are the Isle of Cats, 
the mini golf realm and Biddy and Walter. I'm gonna do a playthrough of these most likely next week, uh, a teach and play session with my standard live plays in the Rolling Realms Facebook group. So stay tuned there or on my YouTube channel, I'll post it, not live, but right after I finish the live cast, I'll post it there. What else is going on here? Uh, Julie says that uh, Catan, so I was talking about Catan earlier. Julie says Catan or Carcassonne was her introduction to modern board gaming post-college as well, a little over 20 years ago. Sounds like we're around the same age, Julie. She says, those two games really changed my perspective on what a tabletop game could be. That absolutely resonates with, with me too. I played pretty solid games before that. Uh, I think Magic the Gathering is a pretty incredible game. Um, Scotland Yard, I think it still holds up. I played those in my, my teenage years, but Catan opened my eyes to what a game could be. And even though I think it gets some flack sometimes, and gamers often move on from Catan, it's very much a it's a gateway game that we you know we level up to to other games, even other games in this category like Space Base. Um, but going back to it last night, there's so many good things about this game. There's good tension in the game. There's there's a, a strong sense of progression in the game, which I think is sometimes th something that modern games forget about a little bit too much. But there there's so much progression in Catan. Um, and, uh, and the trading, the interaction in this game is wonderful. The amount of trading and player interaction that happens at Catan while having the game move along at, at a, a relatively fast pace is pretty incredible. And add Cities and Knights to that, even more progression, even more leveling up and upgrades and, and, and different paths that you can take. I, I, I really, really enjoy um, Catan Cities and Knights in particular. And I, I have a lot of appreciation for what Klaus did years ago to create this, especially without the context of so many other modern hobby games to work from. Andy says he's uh, he, a quick visit as his local library is running a game night at five o'clock UK time. So he's that's right around this time he's heading over to check it out. I hope you have a good time at that, that game night. I love when libraries host games game nights like that. Uh, Dan's doing this. He says I can't remember if you watch Yellow Jackets or not. I haven't watched it yet, but I, I did see that it's available on Amazon Prime now. I think it's typically on Showtime, which was one of the few streaming channels that we don't have. But I think it's on Amazon Prime now, so we might check it out. Dan says the second season has just started and it's just getting better and better, so we highly recommend it. Thank you, Dan, for that recommendation, and it definitely is on our list. Right now, the show that we happen to be watching of all shows is the show Dollhouse. Um, this is a show that Megan watched years ago and wanted to rewatch it, and I've never watched it, and uh, I'm enjoying it. Like I, I didn't know it. Megan gave me an out saying, you know, if you don't enjoy the first episode, second episode, she can watch it on her own. I don't need to watch it, but I actually am kind of enjoying it so far. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, so that's what we're watching right now, along with our Survivor tonight. You know, we have Survivor, uh, we have Ted Lasso, we have Mandalorian, a bunch of other ongoing week-to-week -week shows, but. We're going to watch through the two seasons of Dollhouse. I don't know if any of you have watched that show. And then, Dan, we'll get to Yellow Jackets. This is definitely on my list. I also really want to watch Poker Face. I haven't watched Poker Face yet, but I've heard great things about that. So those, those are on my list right now to check out in the near future. Chat says, I'm sure you're going to make a video about your thoughts on Earth. I will. I'm kind of waiting. I, I could have made a video fast about it after that first play, but... I have a copy coming, so I, I want to be able to hold up things to the camera when I talk about it. So I'm going to wait to my, until my copy of Earth comes and ideally get in another game before I make a video about it. He says, I'm curious about how you'll compare it to Ark Nova. I hear many people now say they would choose Earth over Ark Nova. You know, I've heard, I think people are always eager to compare games like this. Like this game replaces this one, that replaces this one. Um, I don't know if I'll do that, Chad. Uh, I, I appreciate you asking about it, but I'd rather talk about a game based on its own merits um, and what I enjoy about it, rather than compare it to another game. I, I think it's faster than Ark Nova, although our first game of Earth took around two hours. But um, So I think they might fill different needs at times. If I'm in the mood for a tableau builder that lasts, hopefully we can get it down to around 60 minutes, then I might play Earth. 90 minutes, that might be Wingspan. Two, two and a half hours, uh, that might be Ark Nova. Yeah. But I don't know if I'll necessarily compare them other, other than that. Okay, I, talked, I asked about skill tests, so Trevor has an answer about that. He says, I appreciate the sense skill checks a lot, especially with them coming up uh, uh, more on the Overland map, which should be resolved pretty quickly. Trevor, I don't know if you mind saying it, but I haven't played the sense, so if you, if you don't mind typing real quickly, I can also check it out. I don't want I mean to put this burden on you, but if you want to share how the skill tests work in the sense, I'd be curious to hear about them. 
Trevor says also branching paths. I'd say that having a few big branches where the game changes direction is a in a big way is good with a lot of little branches or options. I like the way that you said that. We kind of do that a little bit in the Rise of Fenris. There are, are two bigger splits that happen and then some smaller splits along the way. And oftentimes the things that we uh, that you kind of miss out on by choosing one split might show up later in the campaign. So you're not completely missing out on a big component that we included with the game. Uh, let me, I should take notes about this while I'm doing this. So Trevor says uh, a few big lots of little. Kevin says he likes the consequences to be pretty different. I feel that if there are just small differences, I do not feel as invested in the choices. Investment, yeah, that's a great point investment in choices um i'm gonna write uh converging paths with uh different obstacles obstacles and benefits this is something that came to mind a lot while um so i, I kind of played through oath sworn recently i played one game of oath sworn one full game and then I was so enraptured by the storybook and kind of the uh, the non combaty part of the game, which is a big part of Oath Sword if you choose it to be, um, that I read through the book. I just kind of read through it. I might I made my own choices along the way, and I didn't really even do the skill test. I just I just ran it as kind of a choose your own adventure book, and I found that there were some big split paths and the book actually prompted you to say like if you choose this path this is a big deal so it, it told you that this is a big deal which i thought was very clever um but a lot of the choices because sometimes i read both paths were like if you choose this path you get this type of bonus that you can use later in combat if you choose this other path you get this other bonus that you can use in combat but they pretty much converged on the plane on the same space and the reason for that is because Oathsworn is trying to tell a specific story with you engaging in the story along the way but it has a story to tell and if it has completely different branching paths then it essentially has to write two novels instead of one novel which i understand why they might just want to write one and have one specific storyline that you're following so i'll make a note about that too um storyline how important how much importance do you place on the story presented by the designer or the writer versus the story that you want players to create along the way their own emergent narrative um how which which one you place more importance on i think can, can have an impact on the branching paths um yeah also uh i thought oh sworn did a neat thing by uh oh sworn's clarity in terms of letting you know when a path was really big or not gerald says he likes uh, minor consequences that both merge quickly back to the same path make me feel like making decisions are meaningless and a waste of game time interesting so that's uh, quite different than, than how i feel about it I prefer a linear story or one with hugely different paths, but minor consequences are much easier to design. It's the path of least resistance. I can, I can kind of see that. At the same time, if I want to travel to visit, uh, uh, if I want to go to um, to Kansas City, um, if I take the highway, that's going to give me a very different experience than if I take little back roads all the way to Kansas City. It'll take more time. I'll have maybe a little some side adventures along the way. Um, so, but I end up in Kansas city. I'm fine with it because that's where I wanted to go. I want to go to Kansas city. Uh, so in my opinion, I, I see what you're saying, Gerald, but I, 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 I push back a little bit about the experience and the journey that how much the journey matters, even if you end up at the same place, um, including the obstacles, the, the consequences and the benefits that happen along the way, uh, even though you ended up at the same location. Chad says, I appreciate the path choices that you use in Rise of Fenris. You don't know it at the beginning, but your choices are important, but you still end at the same place in the story. I'd say that's a little bit more similar to Oathsworn, but on a shorter scale, because our campaign is definitely shorter than Oathsworn. Thank you, Susanna. Randall. Randall runs Eagle Griffin Games. Susanna says he's awesome. Yes, it was, it was at the other end of the table. I got, to talk, I got to talk to him a little bit, and it was great to talk to Randall a little bit over lunch. Thank you, Susanna. Julie says... I like the idea of big branching paths, but I would want to be able to play again and try the other paths to see where the story goes. I think this is one of the, the pros and cons really there of having big paths, because if you don't choose one path, then you're missing out on all this content and you, you might feel like you need to play again, which isn't necessarily, necessarily a bad thing. It's a pro and a con, I think. Julie says, I'd also want the choices to lead to equally fun, exciting gameplay, not right versus wrong. I like that a lot, Julie. Um, 
no right versus wrong. Yes. Um, I don't think I've ever experienced this in a board game. Only in video games or choose your own adventure books from when I was a kid, but it would be interesting. I like that a lot. Not right versus wrong. Uh, Zach says, it's definitely not a fun thing to think about, but with the news of classes passing, it makes me wonder if there are plans in place for Stillmeyer Games 100 years down the road when there is no more Jamie. Zach, no, this is a totally, totally fair uh, thing to think about. I, I think about my own mortality from time to time, especially in terms of the people that I try to t take care of, including my team. It's kind of the, the hit by the bus situation. If I were hit by a bus today, um, would Stillmeyer Games be okay? Would 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 you all be okay? Um it, would we would we still be able to serve you? And even though I am kind of the face of the company, I'm here talking to you right now. My team is amazing. Like they are incredibly, I, I don't even want to use the word capable because it's so far and above that, that some of our games would cont continue to operate superbly well. I think they might need to hire a game developer if, uh, if I went away because that's a big part of my role now, like working with other designers to help develop their games. This past week has been a lot of me like uh, looking at game submissions and we and it, Alan does do this. Alan is the original filter for game submissions. Um, but I kind of once he gets it into the into the company, uh, I, I take it from there um, with the designer. A lot of work on that recently with various products and games and games that we're considering. Um, but I think some of games would be would be totally fine without me. Uh, this isn't a hint of anything that's going to happen. This is just me kind of reassuring myself. But I do. If you think about. I think this is an important thing to think about if you run a company, like down to the, the the tiny details as to how would someone get access to my computer? How would they get access to some of the files that would otherwise be locked out by passwords, things like that. So I have some backup plans in place if those things were to happen. Yeah. Miles says he prefers big branching paths. I prefer feeling like there are larger consequences, even if it means I get a story that isn't my favorite of the options. I think that, Miles, I would tie that a little bit to what Julie said about right versus wrong in that um, that there is a story either way, that you haven't hit a dead end either way, that, uh, that, that you're moving forward a little bit. This is actually something I'm struggling a little bit with a game that I have right now. An example in this game, or I'll, I'll pull one outside of the game, but if you, if you have a choice to steal a car versus not steal a car, what that looks like, um, and especially if you attempt to steal the car, are there varying degrees of success or failure? Or is it really just like, if I attempt to steal a car, I'm either going to steal it or not steal it. And then there might be consequences that follow. I might have the cops, the, the police follow me after that, or try to chase me down. I might have the owner of the car be angry at me afterwards. Um, but what is, is that actually a binary choice? And is that okay in the, in the game? So if I, I could steal the car, I could not steal the car. If I do steal the car, um, what, is, what does that mean? And is there anything in the middle? If I if I attempt and I don't manage it, what, what does that mean? I'm trying to figure out, and I'm also trying to figure out what is reasonable for me to design. Because for every choice, if I like break the window of the car, that's also a, uh, you know, there's a path there that happens if I, if I break the window of the car. Did someone see me? Do I get caught? Things like that. But I'm designing a game. There has to be kind of a limit at, at a certain point of how many different paths I let the character or I let players choose. Um, otherwise, I will be designing this game forever. Dominic says, I played a four hour seven player game of side this weekend and pulled off the win with Albion. Congratulations, Dominic, on the win. That's that's really cool. A bit long, but a good time. Yeah, that is a little bit long for game of side, but um, but I'm glad you all had fun with it. Or I hope you you all had fun. I'm glad you had fun with it. Uh, Ray says that uh, rest in peace, Klaus Tuber, and Cities and Knights is my favorite expansion by far. That that is the case for me as well, Ray for Catan. Carol just popped in to say Happy Wednesday. Sam says one skill check that I love is Lands of Galzier. Yes, this is actually one that has varying degrees of success. He says um, the easy, medium, and hard tags in Lands of Galzier give you enough information to know how many symbols you need to roll and really make the push your luck in each check feel tense. I totally agree with that, Sam. I think that's a great addition in Lands of Galzier, especially since it's it's a game that's done by text. Like you can't really you can't see what you're doing. Um, opposed to a game where maybe you can look at a, a a door and see this door, think like, okay, this door might be really hard to to knock down, or this lock might looks old and rusty. Maybe it's pretty easy to pick or to break through. I think when you have that visual, then you put the impetus on the player to figure out what is easy, medium, or hard. Whereas in a in a text based game, letting the game uh, in, inform you a little bit that this will be easier, medium, or hard is a, is a great way to do it. 
Trevor says that he enjoyed Dollhouse as well, the, the nighttime show that Megan and I are watching right now. David says, are you a do the dishes right away kind of person or let them soak kind of person? I keep, I, or we keep the kitchen pretty clean. I, we do it together. Usually I'm, I'm the person to put things away in the dishwasher. Megan does too, of course. Uh, the one exception is that I eat oatmeal every morning and it sticks to the bowl quite a bit. And so I do let the oatmeal bowl st uh, uh, soak in the, in, the, uh, in the sink until lunchtime. And that's when I expect myself to put it into the dishwasher. So otherwise we keep our sink completely clean and, uh, and put things in the dishwasher as soon as possible. Carol says that she's loving Ted Lasso and Mandalorian, and she thinks she watched Dollhouse forever ago. My first time, and surprisingly, I, I think it holds up pretty well. Carolyn says, would you be interested in coming to SalukiCon on April 22nd and 23rd in Carbondale, Illinois? Thank you, Carolyn, for asking about this. Um, Carbondale is about two hours away from, from where I live in St. Louis, and so it's a, it's a bit of a hike for me to get there. I do appreciate the invitation. Those particular dates also conflict with an upcoming trip that I have uh, that I need to be really careful about um, in terms of uh, kind of COVID precautions and things like that. So I don't think I'll be able to attend, but I do very much appreciate the invitation. And we have donated some games to the Play and Win, I believe, um, that you're having. Yeah, I think I, I, I sent them to you recently. But I'm glad you mentioned it here too. If anyone is in the Carbondale area of Illinois, um, I highly recommend, uh, or I, I recommend checking out Saluki Khan. And I also recommend a restaurant that's kind of in that area called, um, what is it? Is it the Iron Whisk? Carolyn, correct me if that's wrong. I believe it's Iron Iron Skillet or Iron Whisk. One of those two. It's a restaurant that we visited a few years ago, and it was absolutely amazing. Highly recommend that if they're still around. Hopefully they are still around. Okay, Trevor it clarified how descent uh, skill checks work. He says, absolutely. They use dice that have different shield counts like pips, and you need to roll a certain number of shields under under your skill level to pass. Interesting. Under your skill level. So if you have a higher skill level, then I guess you have a higher, a better chance of, is that a better chance of rolling? So if you roll, so you're trying to roll fewer shields. I see. So they're kind of blocking. The dice represent who you're, you're attacking. And if they roll six shields, they essentially block six of your attack. And, but your attack is seven, then you overcome those shields and get through for the attack. That makes perfect sense. I like that. I like that. That's, that's, that's clever. Yeah. Ray says, oh, I need to make a note about this multiple. Yeah. Room. Um, lots of thoughts in my mind about skill checks today. Ray says, I like warnings and branching paths for major decisions. Like I was saying about Osworn. He says journeys in middle earth. He thinks journeys in middle earth did a good job with letting players do their thing for the most part, but for big moments, giving warning about it. That's great. I'm, I'm glad that Journeys does that as well. I'll make a note about that. I haven't, I've only played one game of Journeys, but it's neat to hear that they do that as well. Um, before I continue with talk and just talking, uh, I want to mention that our donation total for April Fools, thanks to everything that you bought on our web stores from uh, last Wednesday through end of day, or really beginning of morning on April 2nd. Um, I was going to say end of day on April 1st, but I, I didn't make the donation until the following morning. We donated a total of $5,451, split evenly, split three ways, from uh, a, a, a cat rehabil rehabilitation center in Hawaii, a local place here in St. Louis, the St. Louis Humane Society, where I got Biddy. I also adopted Walter locally from a different shelter, and to Panthera, a, a charity that helps uh, big cats, because our April Fool's was kind of cat-themed. So... Some donations, hopefully, to help the cats of the world. I made that on Sunday. And April, what else? On April Fool's, if you didn't catch it, on Saturday I posted a video this week. Instead of Sunday, I posted a video of uh, pets, different types of pets, strategizing over games. And thank you to all the ambassadors, including some people I see here today, who shared photos of their, their pets looking like they were strategizing while playing games. And I did a top 10 list of, of my favorite photos in that batch. Posted that on... Um, on Saturday as well. Also on Monday, I posted my stakeholder report or our stakeholder reports, kind of the, the state of the last 12 months of Stillmeyer Games. Um, and I uh, just posted kind of the numbers for, for how we're doing, kind of the, the data that I think that you deserve to, to have if you are a stakeholder in Stillmeyer Games. And if you're watching this video, you are a stakeholder. It means that you have some sort of feelings about Stillmeyer Games or you want to have an impact on Stillmeyer Games in some way making you a stakeholder, not a shareholder, a little bit different than a shareholder, but a stakeholder. 
And uh, so yeah, so I posted that that uh, that discussion this past uh, this past Monday in a blog post. It was interesting to see there was a news outlet that covered the article. Didn't actually link to the article, which I thought was a little bit odd. This was ICV2. Um, they commented on it, or they made an article about it, but didn't link to my article. And they their headline was that wingspan sales were down, which I thought was interesting. And technically, it's true. Like wingspan sales over the last year were less than wingspan sales from the previous year, but they were kind of astronomically high in the previous year. We still sold like nearly 300,000 copies of Wingspan in the last year and another 130,000 copies of Wingspan Asia, which is an incredible number of games. That is so many games. So it was interesting to hear that that was like the headline, like game company sells a ridiculous number of a certain copy of a game, but it's less than the previous year. I don't know. Ga games, I think their, their lifespan will change from year to year. And even just the time period that you look at sales will d differ. If you shift it by one day, you might miss X number of copies sold to a distributor. So it's interesting to see that headline. But if you want to check out that stakeholder report, it's on the Stonemaier Games website right now. Yeah, I think that's over the main topics that I meant to cover today. I'll look at the list later a bit as well. Okay, Trevor clarifies in dissent that uh, each die has a different number of shields on it and each in, on, on the dice and on each dice die face. So the probabilities are a little more vague than straight D6s. And Trevor, I would ask about this. After you roll those dice, do you have ways to mitigate the results or is that it? Do you have to mitigate everything up front versus um, in the back end? Because I my preference for skill chest to skill tests are when you have some set information like engine building stuff. You've you've built up your skill in this level, plus a choice of input. You have an input choice. Do you want to put a little extra effort into this attack or this conversation, this negotiation? Then you have a random element. And then you have the choice on the back end to make maybe make a sacrifice or to maybe push your luck a little bit. Um, I, I really like when when games uh, give you all of those choices along the way and not just have like a random element that you have no control over at all. Carol says, missed the initial question, but assuming you were asking about branching paths in games, that's correct. I do like the idea of a combination of big and small because I want some to be more important. I'm hearing that from a lot of people. That they, they really want at least some of the decisions to have major consequences and to be have significantly different outcomes than those smaller choices. Carol also says, journey before destination. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, George says, what are your top three favorite things to do in St. Louis as relaxing slash entertainment activities? Things that you do often and enjoy and you don't get tired of and you don't get bored of them. I mean, I personally love disc golf, which I don't actually know if that's on my list of things to do in St. Louis. Let me see. I have a, a list of a public list. I, I can share this with anyone they, if they're ever visiting St. Louis of things that I recommend doing in St. Louis. Most of it is restaurants, but I also have a list of some things that I kind of touristy things that I recommend doing. Um, yeah, I do have disc golf on the list. Um, so disc golf is like the quintessential St. Louis thing that I do the most often. Eat good food at different places would be the second thing that I do the most often. And then what would be the third? I mean, most of my hobby is built around playing games. And I think if you don't have a hub in St. Louis for playing games, I think the place to go is Pieces Board Game Bar and Cafe. So I think that would be number three on the list right there. For, I, I don't actually go there all that often, even though we do host our annual design day event there, um, because I do have a, a lot of great hubs for playing games and a lot of access to great games with uh, with friends and my own collection. But Pieces is a really, really cool place to visit in St. Louis if you're visiting. Ray says, um, speaking of which, any plans for a story campaign for Expeditions? No plans yet, Ray, but if Expeditions takes off in the same way that Scythe did, I would love to explore that possibility. In fact, I would love to work with Ryan again, if, if Ryan would be open to that. Um, there's maybe one other designer I can think of that would be fun to work on, work with on that. Uh, but, but Ryan was a lot of fun to work with on The Rise of Fenris. I think he did a great job. He's the one that, that he didn't necessarily create the entire story because Jakob steered the story a lot, but Ryan played a big part in that story and he did 95% at least of the writing available in, in The Rise of Fenris. He's a very talented writer. Beverly, Beverly last week had the idea um, of uh, us finding someone to do a, li a solo live play of Tuscany, Viticulture's expansion Tuscany, or Viticulture with Tuscany. Thank you, Beverly, for suggesting that. And uh, we heard, this is one of the wonderful things about saying things out loud on videos like this, 
um, and saying things like Beverly did, that a content creator who was watching the video messaged me afterward and said, hey, I would love to do that. Would, would, could I do that for you? Um, so we sponsored, we are sponsoring a solo playthrough of Tuscany from Board Game Garden. Jenna at Board Game Garden will be doing a solo playthrough on Twitch on April 8th. I don't know the exact time. I also don't have a link to her Twitch channel. But if you search for Board Game Garden on Twitch, I'm sure you'll find it. And she also, she has two YouTube channels. She has her standard kind of like review Board Game Garden review channel. But she also has a YouTube, I'm talking about YouTube now. She has a YouTube uh streaming channel so she'll take that twitch video and a few days later she'll put that entire playthrough on her streaming youtube channel so it'll be permanently there on youtube so thank you beverly for that idea say like i love when people say what they want and what they're looking for and stuff like that because content creators might be following along might be willing to make stuff like that which i think is wonderful that jenna reached out and volunteered to do that carol says i enjoy how open sleeping gods is you make cho your choices feel meaningful Lots of content, and you can go back in other campaigns to explore different choices. I really like that too, Carol. And actually, one other thing that I think Sleeping Gods does so well is even if you choose one path, it doesn't necessarily negate your ability to go back and take a different path later. Like if I say this island with a, with a volcano looks really cool, let's let's go over there. And I think I have a quest that has to do with that island. I'll go over there. I'll deal with that quest. I'll visit that volcano and do some st cool stuff there. But this other tiny little island with a little mouse on it, that looked interesting too, but me going to the volcano hasn't negated my ability to go to the, the mouse. I'm just a little further away. Maybe I'm no longer as interested in it because I have a whole other adventure that I gained at the volcano island, but it's still there for me to go back and look at later if I want to. I really like that about Sleeping Gods. I had that on my list to talk about. Carol says the King's Dilemma. Yeah, King's Dilemma is another one with big branching paths. Made choices very difficult if you wanted to go moral versus personal objectives on the tracks for an individual game. I'm reading Carol's comment here. But King, the King's Dilemma is an interesting one because in a lot of these games, it's kind of like it's in the storybook, you make a different choice. So it's just text in a storybook that you miss out on. And maybe you miss out on gaining a certain card. In the King's Dilemma, you are missing out on opening entire envelopes that never entered the game at all. Like I think by the end of our King's Dilemma campaign, nearly half of the envelopes in the campaign were not used, which is a significant, uh, uh, I don't know, I want to say expense and, and, and effort that King's, the King's Dilemma designers put into the game that players will never see, which I think is impressive. I don't want to say wasteful, uh, but it may be a little bit because uh, and I don't feel I don't feel I'm glad, I'm glad that we made our own choices that are so different. Um, but it almost makes the King's Dilemma even difficult to talk to people about because my experience with that, with that campaign is so different than someone else's experience. So I think that's, that's one of the downsides to having such a non-linear campaign with big branching paths. You can't, it's really hard to talk about it. Like you can tell your story, but it's hard to relate to someone else's story with the same game. Whereas in a game like Pandemic Legacy, which had a fairly linear um, storyline with, with maybe different like characters, different things happening to different characters along the way. But we can talk about that. We have a, a common ground to talk about that. Kind of like if we talk about a TV show or a movie. You didn't watch a completely different movie than I watched. We watched the same movie. Um, we just have different, I watched it at a different theater or at home and we're, we're opposed to where you watched it. So, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll bring this up about like uh, the conversation topic. Topic of linearity. Chat says, I think choices that have consequences need to have a way to let players know what the consequences are, or at least the severity of the consequences. I think that would pose a good choice in the game. Yeah, this is, uh, oh, yeah, do you, do you let players know what those consequences are? Like, how transparent are you about that? I'll make a note about that. Do you tell players the consequences? If you go fully thematic, I think you don't tell players the consequences. You don't tell them that uh, making this choice leads to this thing. That's for them to discover. Like, they don't know that choice yet. Um, but at the same time, it takes away agency from players. If I know that path A will give me an awesome sword and path B will give me two coins, that would factor into my decision in a huge way. I, I want the cool sword, obviously. I'll do whatever I can to get that cool sword. Um, but how do I know that? Do you show players that? Do you show them a, 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 a creature, a monster on that path, holding, wielding a cool sword? And on the other path, you show them that merchant um, who, who's looking to buy something from you? Uh, and if with that visual, with that information, I can infer that I might have a chance at a cool sword, 
might have a chance of losing some health along the way too. If I go to the monster with the merchant, I might get something. I might I might be able to to, uh, to sell something. So yeah, I, I I like the way you said it. at least the severity of the consequences or a hint at what the consequences may be at the, at, a, at a minimum. Gerald says, returning to the same big path is fine for me, like all paths ending in Kansas. <laughs> I feel tricked if almost if it almost immediately returns to the path or decisions are undone by the game or interactive movie. Oh, yeah. If you've undone something, I absolutely agree with that. So um, no undoing consequences. So that, yeah, there's, there's a permanence to that. Also, I want to make a note about Sleeping Gods. Gods. Uh, uh, Sleeping Gods, you haven't, uh, n no dead ends. Uh, Gerald says, like, do you break Jimmy out of a prison? Yes or no? Then no matter what you pick, soon after Jimmy is out of the prison. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's a great point. Carol says that she's hoping that uh, her cat shirt and realms come today. Trevor likes the stakeholder report. Ray is also an accountant. He's relating to Trevor there. Um, Trevor says for the skill checks, there is not a way to modify. Typically, he's talking about descent again. Strangely, for a campaign game, it's a very slow engine builder. I don't think any of our characters have cards that affect skill checks specifically. But there's also attack rules and defense rules, which are different and can have lo loads of alterations. That's cool. Corey says his wife and him went to the Butterfly Sanctuary in St. Louis last year during Geekway, and it was nice. You know, I need to add that to the list because I think Megan went there recently. Um, Megan, are you, can you hear me? No, she's off. So I, is it called the Butterfly Sanctuary or something else? Butterfly House, maybe? Butterfly. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. Miles says he loved that King's Dilemma felt so unique to our play experience. It did feel really good. I mean, it really felt like we were telling our own story uh, with the game having a written story that was really interesting to follow. And King's Dilemma does it in a really interesting way, too, because you are adding new cards to a deck, but even then you don't know in which order those cards will come out. You don't even necessarily know if you will see any or all of those cards that you've added to the deck. Um, it's, a, it's a really ambitious design, and uh, yeah, we, I had a blast playing it. Carol says, King's Dilemma almost seems to qualify as an anomaly in board games and how it managed to work. Yeah, I, I, I am amazed that they got that game to work, and I'm excited about Queen's Dilemma as well. Ray points out he thinks people who lurk, work in analytic, analytical professions are often drawn to board games. And Susanna does clarify Butterfly House. That is the name of the place. Um, Megan showed me some photos and it, it looked really, really beautiful. David says, Above and Below has bits of narrative that are more flavor than story. I would agree with that. But by the end of the game, you feel like your characters have gone on their own adventures, which is an interesting contrast to big narrative games. Yeah, I like, I like the way that you put that. That characters have gone on their own adventures along the way. That is my experience with Above and Below as well. I do think that Ryan has gotten better at those narratives over time. Not that Above, Above and Below was the very strong start. I really like the narrative in Near and Far. Although near, in Near and Far, I think the mechanisms are super, super strong. The skill tests, in fact, we're talking about skill tests. The skill tests in Near and Far are incredible. I mentioned that I love skill tests that have a sacrifice after the random input. And uh, in the case of, of, uh, of uh, Near and Far, that sacrifice is health. And so you can, you can pay health to just succeed at a skill test. But when you run out of health, you either fail the skill test or you then have to go back to town and recharge your health before heading out again. So you have a great choice in town. How much health do I charge up on before heading out on these adventures that I really want to go on? Great skill test, I think, in, uh, in Near and Far. Julie says her favorite place in St. Louis is the Missouri Botanical Garden. Yes, it is. I, I hope that's on my list. Yes, the Botanical Gardens are on my list. They are, they are beautiful. They're huge. It's wonderful to walk around there. They have different seasonal events and seasonal um, setups there at the Botanical Gardens. Julie says huge, gorgeous grounds with a lot of room to walk around on a nice day. Also, Julie, I'm, since I think you're in St. Louis as well, uh, on my list, I put some places that are like dining experiences where you're getting food, but you're also having a unique experience while you're there. And on my list, I, I need to expand this, but I have getting tea and like crumpets basically and delicious desserts at La Choquette or the London Tea Room or uh, dining and playing at Pieces Boarding Bar and Cafe or um, going to the, the plant nursery slash 
uh, a, a dining facility at Bowood. But can you think of anything else like that, Julie, where it's not just good food or drinks or desserts, but also a special experience that accompanies that? Because I think those two can go together really well for someone who's traveling. Maybe not an everyday thing, but it is, I think, a fun touristy type thing to, to offer that option. George said that he played a five-player game of Here I Stand on Sunday, and it took us the entire day, and it was an, what, and it was in overhead and rules terms, a 45-page rule book of plain small text. This is a war game at base, but it had a 10 to 15 minute delay between your turns, so players barely made it through the experience. It was interesting overall. Wow, and that was just five players. I was thinking, I was, I was reading this, that this might be like a huge group game. That's intense, George. So are you glad you spent your day doing that? Is it, is it the type of game that you'll only play once? or that you might revisit in the future. I think I have a video, video coming about, out about that soon, like games, uh, like played it once games. You're happy you played it once, but you probably wouldn't play it again, even if you really enjoyed it. Carol, I was talking about Sleeping Gods here. Being able to come, go back seems to come back as important. In Sleeping Gods, different decisions lead to different totems, yes. I looked at the other decision in one dungeon and realized that we got something really cool from a decision, but we missed the totem. So I made a note to go back in that dungeon in another campaign, yeah. Trevor says, I like the idea of giving something to succeed at a skill test. Each RPG I've worked on has had that component. It's such a cool feel. I love the idea of giving something to succeed at a skill test. Yeah. Carol likes near and far as well. She's back to work. Uh, Miles says that Botanical Gardens is our go-to day trip. And Miles says this is someone who has a beautiful garden at his house. Thank you, uh, Corey, for linking to the Butterfly House here for anyone who's curious. Julie says, I've been to the London Tea Room and Pieces. I would agree that those places are great to visit. I have to think about other options. Yeah, let me know if you think of anything. I admit that the pandemic and parenthood have affected our dining out. Totally. Yeah, we actually, we had, other than our trip to Alaska, where we didn't really have much of a choice because it was freezing outside. We haven't eaten inside a restaurant um, at all during the pandemic. We've only gotten to go up until two weeks ago when Megan's parents were here. And then since then, we've eaten in restaurants like three or four times. I think we really missed it. Um, so we've... Uh, we are back to trying that. Tentatively, it still makes us a little bit nervous. We had a wonderful meal out at a place called A Car in St. Louis recently. This past weekend, A-K-A-R. Really, in fact, I need to add that to my food recommendations because it was amazing. Let's see, I'll add it to my fancy expensive list because it was fancy, it was expensive, but it was absolutely worth it. Yeah, really, really good food at A Car. Where's my to try list? No, I guess not on here. Yeah. George says the skill test in John Company is based on custom dice for randomness and a unique event system in India with shuffling around tiles with surprise elements coming up. Oh, that's cool. I'll have to check out the uh, the skill test there and the, the the thing you mentioned in India. Well, thank you all for joining me today. This hour breezed by with our discussion about, discussion about skill tests and branching paths. I had a lot of fun, and I haven't even filmed the real videos about it yet. So thank you so much for joining me for this discussion. I hope you have a great Wednesday, a great week, and I will see you next week for another a uh, session like this and a Rolling Realms live play with the new Rolling Realms. I'll see you then. Bye.